This week's guest is a technologist who is universally known in real estate circles as the mad scientist of multifamily. And besides being one of the most in-demand speakers in commercial real estate, he's a data guru that treats his $947 million portfolio as an ongoing experiment in efficiency and optimization. His company invests in 10 different states and he really keeps emotion out of it and he simply goes where the data tells him to. He's the founder of the multifamily and commercial real estate investment company, Grow Capitas. Hey, it's your first time. Welcome here, Neil Bawa. Thanks for having me on the show, Keith. Very excited to be here. Let's start at the beginning. I mean, really, how does a computer engineer and a data scientist end up in commercial real estate with a quasi-billion dollar portfolio now? Well, I'm going to give you the stereotyped answer, like, you know, like millions of others, right? 2006, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I realized that, you know, I have this massive W-2 tech income, and I'm mostly giving away my salary both to the IRS and to Taxifornia, right? It's it's <laughs> not what you make, it's what you keep. So like many other tech geeks, I started my invest, investing my money into real estate for tax benefits. And that's really where my story became different. So I'm a data scientist and I, I saw lots and lots of million dollar tech companies turn into billion dollar tech companies just by applying data science, right? It's the most popular job in the US, by the way, today for high paying jobs. And I noticed that the biggest chunk of investment in real estate actually came from retail investors, you know, mom and pop investors. They had no concept of data science, no concept of statistical analysis. So I realized I actually have a huge advantage over other people because I could use big data to predict trends and locations that people had never even heard of. In, in technology, we do that. We do it and we get a few months of advantages before somebody else comes along and they do it much better than us. But in real estate, I realized nerds like me can actually create lasting advantages, right? We can actually stay ahead of everyone else for years and years and years. So this real estate data science, it became an obsession. It became a hobby of mine. So from 2008 to 2014, six years, I ran this big tech company, hundreds of employees, and I was spending every evening, every weekend, mining data about US cities and creating and applying data science rules to real estate. And then I was using those rules to buy a pretty decent sized portfolio portfolio using my own money. And then I started sharing my thoughts. I started teaching data science at meetups in the San Francisco Bay Area. Eventually ended up becoming a micro celebrity. There's conference organizers that started calling me to teach people about how to use big data. They liked the fact that I didn't have anything to sell. Like, you know, I'm not a real estate guy. I was just sharing what I was doing with my own portfolio. And so my nerdy audiences sort of liked that. So I got better. I got funnier at presenting. And so this community of nerds sort of gathered around me. And once I sold my tech company in 2013, I you know, retired for a year, then decided to jump in full time. Here I am. I mean, I'm working with about 800, you know, nerdy investors. I keep using that word on about a billion dollars in real estate. And it's just sort of happened. Uh, you know, it wasn't really planned. A lot of investors started by reading that little purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but you became atypical somewhere along the way. Not everyone can be the mad scientist of multifamily real estate like you are. And, you know, Neil doesn't quite use flasks and beakers and, you know, he didn't quite burn his microphone there with a, a Bunsen burner while we're talking, but he has differentiated himself as being really different in the industry. And, and Neil, I know one place where you come down differently than a lot of people do in the industry. So tell us about the impact of real estate to the real estate industry and what you're doing to mitigate the impact of that for all the people that are investing with you. I think it's going to be very dramatic and, and really one simple reason for that. You mentioned it. Everyone's worrying about interest rates going up and they're ignoring the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is QE or quantitative easing. Right On March 11, 2020, when COVID started, the Federal Reserve of the US had a balance sheet of 4.3 trillion, that's with a T. Today, that balance sheet is 9 trillion. So essentially over the last two years, the Fed became the buyer of last resort and they printed $5 trillion to buy anything that anyone else didn't want to buy. Bonds and mortgages and municipal debt, you name it, anything. And now the Fed is going the other way. Instead of buying all of these things, they're starting to sell them. So we go from an insanely liquid market where everything gets bought to a more normal market. And the real estate market is not priced for normal. It's priced for crazy. I can tell you what I'm doing. I First thing is accept the risk. This is not the end of the real estate market. The market goes up, market goes down, rates go up, rates go down. And even, even over the last 10, 15 years where rates have been falling in general, there are lots of times where they've spiked one, one and a half percent up and didn't end the market, didn't end the party. But first, accept 
the risk. Once you accept the risk, ask what you can do. Every one of us is going to be able to actually do different things if you really, really think about it. So I'm going to give you an example of how big a deal I think this is for me, right? Yeah. So one of the things, one of my divisions builds turnkey fourplexes for investors. So we sell, you know, we sold about $50 million worth last year. For all of those people, we've introduced an interest rate cap program. So we pay the extra interest beyond a certain interest rate threshold, right? And we call this the Grow Capitus Interest Rate Protection Program or GERP, horrible acronym, by the way. And we've already seen this massive uptake amongst our investors. The hunger, the desire to buy quality real estate is there, but people are afraid. They're sitting on the sidelines because of interest rates. So the moment we gave them a way to just completely forget about the interest rate, we saw a massive uptake. So I think, Keith, we're going to see many more creative measures like that to keep the party going because overall the market is strong, but we've got to do something to get investors over this interest rate hump. So that's just an example. Interest rates having so much to do with that affordability component of real estate. We continue to be in this unusual time where we have this inversion, where we have inflation that's greater than interest rates. We do. And again, some of these are momentary. Some of these, you know, come and go. We've seen these kinds of inversions happen happened before, but there's something else that's happening. You know, in my mind, what I'm seeing, Keith, is this, that the biggest challenge in real estate today is something known as confirmation bias. We have investors who in the last 10 years, all they've learned is that for the vast majority of people that invest in real estate, they're going to make money. They're not going to lose any money. So less than 1% of investors that invested in real estate over the last 10 years, you know, lost money. That's a very, 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 very small, much larger than, you know, the, let's say the stock market, much smaller than the stock market. And because of that, there's this confirmation bias that the next 10 years are going to look like the last 10. And they can't. They, they never absolutely do. can't. And especially, and, and, and there's a few things I want to, you know, mention there. Number one, if you're data driven, you know that well over 80% of all profits from real estate in the last decade came from appreciation. Well over 80%, right? So, 10 to 15% came from uh, from cash flow. Now, the second piece of this, the US market for the last 25 years has been the world's anomaly. No developed country in the world other than the US has any real cash flow. Not Canada, not Europe, Japan, India, China. No one has cash flow. Worldwide, real estate is a pure appreciation play. And today it's turning into that in the US because prices are going up much faster than rents are. And Everyone who thinks that this is unsustainable actually doesn't understand that real estate is now a preferred asset class worldwide. More and more institutional money coming in, more and more retail money coming in, so that cash flow is going to keep diminishing. Sure, every time there's a recession, prices will go down. After recessions, they'll go up. But the overall direction is for the rent to price ratio to keep going down worldwide. So forget 1%, in many countries, it's not even half a percent. And real estate's still a huge asset class in those countries. We are not any different, we're just catching up. And the harsh reality of that needs to be accepted by the real estate investment markets, right? So this is something that needs to change. You need to start stop chasing these outdated rules like 1% and understand the challenges the next 10 years cannot resemble the last 10 because the last 10 was so crazy unusual. When Neil mentions the 1%, he's talking about the rent to value ratio, which some people call the rent to price ratio. That's the ratio of one month's rent to the total purchase price or value of the property. And That's yeah, right. Neil, Americans have had it good in, in some contexts still have it pretty good. There was a recent media article published about how Canadian residential real estate prices are fully twice of United States residential real estate prices. That's right. And you can apply that to any, almost any country in Europe, right? So you can apply that to London, you can apply it to Paris, any major country in the world, or if you want to apply it to Asia, Singapore and Hong Kong are 3x or 4x the US. So you're right. We've still got it better than everyone else in the world. But keep in mind, most of the world, when you buy real estate, you're cash flow negative for five to 10 years. So you've got to take it in context that cash flow is going to diminish. And what you need to do is build strategic advantages. And that's what one of the things that my company does. We've realized that with the population growth in the US slowing dramatically, right? And then you have this aging population, you've got debt overhangs, which are slowing growth. In the next 10 years, the people that are going to win in real estate are going to be people that use data and are very strategic. In the last 10 years, 
as long as you you did a decent job of finding a good place to rent you made money regardless of where you did it in the us you could have done it anywhere from right. detroit to san francisco i am going to argue that that is absolutely 100% impossible in the next 10 years the vast majority of people that will lose money are people that will do what they did in the last 10 i'm going to buy a nice property i'm going to manage it and it's going to make money. No, it's going to lose money. So you have to use data science. What is essentially going to happen is roughly 70% of US counties are losing population. That's going to accelerate. So it's going to get to about 76, 77% within the next five years. It's the rest of the, the US, the remaining 23%, where 99% of real estate profits are going to be made adjusted for inflation. You may still make dollars, but you've got to stay ahead of inflation to actually make any real money. If you want to stay ahead of inflation and make real money, real wealth, you've got to be playing in the 23% of the US where population growth and job growth, income growth, home price growth, crime reduction is still very, very strong. And so we think this is one of those cases where the data people are going to take over, right? There's this, I've only ever coined one phrase in my life, Keith, but I think it's a good one, right? So I say, the Bible got it wrong by one letter. It is not the meek that shall inherit the earth, Keith. It is the geek. It's the geek, <laughs> right? I mean, look at it. Richest man in the world, geek. Second richest, geek. Third richest, geek. You see a pattern developing there, Keith? You see a pattern developing, right? Spoken I mean, like a data-driven scientist. I know. I'm, I, hey, I'm a nerd and I'm proud of it. So to me, what I believe is going to happen is real estate will get riskier for people that are not using data science because everyone else that's using data science is making it riskier for you. You can watch this one next.